Welcome to ConExpo ConAg Radio, brought to you by the Association of Equipment Manufacturers with your host, Peggy Smedley. Welcome back to ConExpo ConAg Radio. I'm your host, Peggy Smedley. Our next guest today is a research and GIS analyst with a multinational commercial real estate brokerage specializing in database research, gem- demographic analysis, and GIS. Please welcome Brian Landis, GIS analyst with TransWestern. Brian, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you, Peggy. So, Brian, I have to ask, I, I saw some research you guys just did, and is it true the number that you guys are saying is $3.6 trillion by 2020 is underfunded in infrastructure? Is, is that the number you guys are saying, that our infrastructure is pretty weak right now? Our infrastructure, I, there's some really good spots to it, but we're definitely saying that we're looking at $3.6 trillion just to bring it up to a level that's just okay. We're not even talking about, you know, improvements or going beyond just what we just our very basics. But 3.6 trillion would bring us up back up to adequate. Uh, The American Society of Civil Engineers graded overall just U.S. infrastructure as a whole, that being our roads, our rails, our water our water system, generally over at a D plus. So we're passing, but not not passing very well. But we have some pretty prominent infrastructure projects that are currently underway throughout the country. Would you say? Absolutely. Yes, locally there, locally and regionally, there are some very large projects in the pipeline right now that are going through sort of in spite of, let's say, uh, kind of gridlock at the, gov- at the government level. And, and what, what do we have to do? Can you, can you talk about what you're seeing? What, what are some of these that you're seeing right now? Oh, sure. Yes, I mean, there are a lot of projects happening right now, um, you know, ranging the gambit from uh, rail, tr- rail tunnels to new water systems to really a lot happening with ports. So a lot of what we're seeing uh, is generally happening a lot more in a lot of our larger cities, but some major ones, um, New York and New Jersey, they, re- they just redid, New Jersey just redid um, the New Jersey Turnpike through central New Jersey, which is the largest um, freight hub in the northeast. So they have six new lanes, which they can facilitate getting, tra- getting you know, transporting trucks and people through that corridor and getting out freight from the port of New Jersey and the port of Philadelphia out through the greater northeast. Uh, they're building a new, there's plans to build an additional rail tunnel under the Hudson River in New York that will um, ease rail traffic through that corridor. Um, moreover, they're finally, if they also sticking with New York, they're finally building the Second Avenue subway, which will help get people up and down the uh, east side of Manhattan. This has been something that's been talked about since the 60s. Uh, I'm recalling about a few months, a couple years back, there was a joke in Mad Men that in 1966 that the subway was going to be done in two years, and that is not going to happen for another two years. So it was only about 50 years too late. But uh, <laughs> but well, a lot of what we're seeing I, is I also have... in, in regards yes. No, no, I was going to say, I have to admit, when I go over some of these bridges, I'm a little scared. I mean, you, you want to close your oh, eyes when you're going over a few of the bridges, right? Absolutely. And some of them have seen better days. But there's, still, there's a lot that's happening. And, some, and a lot of what we're seeing is also coming as um, an advent from the Panama Canal expansion, which actually just opened in the last couple of weeks. So that spurred on a lot of our ports to kind of increase growth and uh, increase some of the pipe and increase some of the projects of what they're doing. So we're seeing... A lot of, uh, particularly ports on the east and south and um, southeast coasts, gearing up and raising bridges, adding additional capacity, um, building new tunnels, dredging for deeper harbors. So we're really seeing them wait and see. So it's, they're anticipating all that growth of um, a lot of new shipping traffic that would have been stopping it on west coast ports coming to the east. So we're seeing a lot of that happening as well. So all right. So as a GIS expert, let's talk about where do you see the most room for growth in this construction industry, because there's a lot of reports right now that we're talking about, you know, we're going to have growth, we're not going to have growth, but there's a lot of opportunity for growth. So, so let's talk about that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, GIS fits into the construction industry as part of, I would say, the Internet of Things, meaning that you're attaching data and what I would call a spatial element to, every, to kind of everything. So whether that being that, you're trans, that, say, in the construction industry, you can actually track and manage, um, you know, materials, people, um, labor, and everything else, kind of where, where everything is at in the pipeline. You can also integrate uh, CAD designs and drawing into, into your GIS databases. So a construction person can, or a professional can look beyond, you know, just CAD drawings and kind of, state, and kind of 2D imagery to also see, you know, and also integrate in data, say, for watershed or drainage or where the utility and the telecom lines are 
and all this can be deployed. So a lot, and a lot of all this was being done, sort of in the background by somebody in, by somebody on like a desktop in an office. And now that is being synced with mobile apps, such that the person, the professional in the field, can see what you know, where all, can look into these databases, see what's happening in live, in real time, and also make changes on the fly. So if that, that person is out in the field, sees this part, this you know particular line is maybe two feet off, they can go in their app, change it it syncs back with what the person is seeing on the desktop. So really having the, the data is talking both ways, both from the person in the field and the analyst in the office. So you're really having this kind of interplay where the data, where you're having a live GIS in system more so than you've ever had before. So, so let's talk about this with taking that in our ability to improve cities and infrastructure. Are we seeing mm -hmm. cities understand that we can maybe do this now to improve and, and the resources, you know, because right now we're, we've just talked about that cities have the greatest advantage right now to maybe improve things mm -hmm. that they haven't been able to do in the last 100 years. Now with the technologies yeah. that we're talking about, like GIS, to be able to improve collaboration, save labor, save costs, are we starting to see cities saying, look, if we use some of this technology, we could do things we haven't been able to do on the construction side and maximize things in greater efficiencies? Are they starting to say, look, let's tap into this so that construction can do things, our contractors, our, our, our whole design teams can do things they've never been able to? Are, are we tapping into that? Or are we saying, well, we still can't afford it? Are, are they getting it? Are, are we starting to see that? A little bit of both. I, I, think a, I think a big push that we're seeing right now is that a lot of these larger infrastructure projects are coming about as through public-private partnerships. So you're really seeing a lot of this construction technology and GIS technology that has been very highly utilized, where the, it's been to some degree been used by cities and local governments, but it's also been highly utilized by the private sector for development, and they're integrating it into some of these large projects. So like in, um, you know, the Mets, back to New York again, using, they're using it with, the Hudson, with Hudson Yards, where you're having a public-private partnership where you've got one developer developing the condos and the offices and all basically everything above ground, where you're also working with the Metropolitan Transportation Administration there and developing a new subway stop and a subway extension and also rerouting some of their water infrastructure. And even out west it, with the Port of Oakland, redeveloping the former naval base with, where it's partly being done by the city and the port, but it's also being redeveloped in, in conjunction with Prologis, the largest um, industrial re real estate investment trust in the world, and local developers who are bringing in capital and market expertise to kind of really speed up the check, speed up the project, and utilize utilizing a lot of that more advanced technology that might traditionally be, um, you know, used for that sort of project. Really, and additionally too, it helps speed up the pipeline. So some of these projects that have taken 10, 20, 30 years can be done in five. So are you saying these public and private partnerships are going to help these underdeveloped infrastructures that we're talking about? And what's the ultimate benefit to these these public and private partnerships is it you know we're going to have better airports so private planes can come in w what are we saying what's the benefit we have more infrastructure so we can have better um you know tech centers what what's the benefit to these public private partnerships then a little bit of both of what you mentioned i, I think the main benefit being that you have and you know, certain it may it depends sort of where what area you're in, but a lot of areas you have that were had a lot where the government may have owned a lot of had a lot of interest in redevelopment projects and owned a lot of the land, but especially since the last since the recession starting in 07, 08, and but that certainly ended now. But you have seen a lot of those teams on the government side, their headcount has been reduced, so they don't necessarily have the manpower to kind of deploy and get these projects rolling. Whereas at the same time, if you bring in some of these private partners that are experts in development and experts in construction, they can really help facilitate this, these projects moving forward. I think the, the biggest piece is really about using, is about bringing in the gov a lot of governments recognizing that we are not experts at development and construction. Let's bring in those experts, give them a piece of this project, and let them, so we can actually get the project rolling and speed up the development cost. So it's still very much a public project, and, public, and most of these projects are very much in the, you know, divi designed around the public good but you're using the experience and the knowledge of the private sector to really ease the development and speed it through. And, and we, have you seen a lot of them? I know we've seen a lot of things where Google and Tesla have done that on the autonomous vehicle. Do you see a lot more increasing in, in the coming months, or, or is that what we're going to see? Absolutely. And, and I think with mentioning Google and Tesla, 
they've been good examples of innovative companies that to some extent have been acting first and then as sort of asking forgiveness later, whereas now they're sort of maybe slowing down their development just a touch and partnering and working with the gov- working with government entities to try and develop their technology while in, the con- while in concert working with infrastructure. So new things like with Google and Tesla and developing autonomous cars, how can we work, say, with the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration such that, you know, you're developing autonomous cars while also keeping the high standards of safety for the ro- for road and other users? Well, Brian, it's been great to have you on the show. We're out of time, but uh, I will look forward to hearing more as we start seeing the infrastructure and things doing more in construction. But thanks for being with us. Thank you, Peggy.